Okay. Thanks for joining Too Important to Fail, How to Bring Better AI to Healthcare webinar. Um, my name is Jordan Liebwitz and I'm part of the marketing team here at IMO. Before we get started, I wanna take care of a few items for those attending. First off, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to you after the webinar. Throughout the session, all attendees will be in listen-only mode, but if you have any questions, please type them into the question section on your GoToWebinar console. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session as well, and we'll get to as many questions as we can, but if for any reason yours is not addressed, we'll follow up with you after the presentation. Today, we have two speakers, Mark D. Parody, VP of Data Strategy at Northwell Health, and Dale Sanders, our Chief Strategy Officer here at IMO. So as mentioned before, if you have any questions or comments while our presenters are speaking, please type them into your control panel. With all of this being said, I'll pass it on over to Dale. Thanks, Jordan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And especially a big thanks to Mark. He's um, just an esteemed friend and colleague. We've been friends for somewhere between 10 and 15 years. Some people have claimed that we look like brothers. Uh, I'm, we've never tested that genetically, so who knows? Who knows? But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm just grateful for Mark and his friendship and his knowledge and experience, but also grateful for him sponsoring this topic today. I think it's super important to all of us in the tech industry, but also just as patients, right? We, we really want AI to live up to what it could do for all of us as patients and our families. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. And again, thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Dale. Uh, uh, and it has been a... Uh... A fantastic, um, let me see, make sure we can get the slides to advance here. There we go. Um, it has been a fantastic and eventful uh, 10 plus years that, that we've known each other, and um, I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation today. So, uh, without further ado, I'll just jump right into this. Uh, I'll just do a quick little intro on my background. Um, uh, Mark Parody, Vice President, Data Strategy for Northwell Holdings and Ventures, uh, the for profit arm of the nonprofit Northwell Health System. Uh, I've been building and implementing both predictive and uh, inferential models for over 25 years, mostly in the healthcare space. And in my current role as a VP of data strategy, I'm responsible for assessing all of our investments from a data science, machine learning, and AI standpoint, uh, as well as for setting data strategy for the, the health system as a, as a whole. Um, since most of you probably are not too familiar with Northwell Health, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce who we are. Uh, we are an integrated healthcare delivery system of more than 32,000 mission-driven clinicians and over 74,000 selfless employees supporting that mission. Uh, our mission is to raise health not only for the 11 plus million people uh, in, our, in our service area and their communities, uh, um, but also in so doing to really raise health for everyone. And again, that, that service area is uh, all of Long Island. Uh, all five boroughs in New York City uh, and, and Westchester County. So we are 23 hospitals with more than 830 outpatient centers, um, uh, really covering the entirety of the, of, the, of the U.S. healthcare spectrum, from tertiary care hospitals to specialty hospitals to community hospitals, clinics, practices, ambulatory services uh, of, of all kinds. Um, I think we are unique for many reasons, uh, but I'd like to draw attention to uh, uh, a few things uh, that make our, our data assets unique. Uh, again, that, that service area of over 11 and a half plus million lives is arguably the most ethnically diverse, socio-demographically diverse, culturally diverse, economically diverse, and genetically diverse uh, population in the U.S. And, and, and most likely the world. Um, our scale as a system is really enormous. Uh, we treat more than 2 million distinct patients annually uh, with over 5 and a half million patient encounters. Um, more than 19,000 New Yorkers every year uh, um, uh, come through our doors for cancer treatment, uh, more than two and a half million radiology studies every year. Uh, and one of my favorite facts is 1% uh, of all births in the US uh, occur in a Northwell hospital or, or facility. And um, the, the, the list goes on. Uh, of course, like many other uh, New York health systems, we were and still are very much on the front lines of, of COVID. Uh, uh, and uh, by this point in time, we actually do have detailed longitudinal clinical data on more than 70,000 COVID patients from the first wave, um, uh, more than 17,000 of whom were, were treated as inpatient, and of course, several thousand more from, from subsequent waves. So I, I could go on, but I think you're probably beginning to get uh, a sense of uh, some of what makes us unique and our data assets unique. One 
question that's always good to answer early, I think maybe it's just a couple of slides on, on level setting. And one is, um, why does data matter, right, in a, in a talk about AI? Uh, and for many of you, I'm sure this will be sort of obvious and self-evident, but, but for those who, who aren't, right, data is really the raw material of AI. Um, uh, there is, in fact, no artificial intelligence uh, uh, without high quality data. Um, we've talked a lot and it's become very clear in all of our minds over the, over the last two years, although many of us who've been uh, really in the trenches with AI and, and ML and data science uh, for the last three, four, five years, it's been very clear the importance and the necessity of fair and unbiased AI. Uh, and that really requires broadly representative data for that AI to, to be trained on. Uh, accurate and durable AI, uh, um, uh, in order for the AI to, to really work, it's got to be implemented and validated in real world settings. It can't just be toy data sets or, or academic data sets. It has to be real world data collected from real clinical workflows. And, and finally, um, uh, uh, in order for that AI to be commercializable, uh, it's got to deliver quantifiable, out, uh, quantifiable value. And, and the only way that you can really deliver that quantifiable value is if you are impacting measurable outcomes, hard outcomes, uh, on top of which you can then um, uh, calculate or quantify that, that value. So just another quick level setting slide, because um, there's often a lot of confusion around what AI is and what it isn't. Uh, um, I've sort of jumped to the punchline at the top of the slide here, um, and which is really that AI is a, it's a moving goalpost. Um, uh, and, and quite frankly, it's whatever computers can't quite yet do today or what they're just on the verge of, of being able to do. Um, but to give it a little bit more concrete context, uh, AI was first defined at the Dartmouth Conference in 1956, and so AI sort of counts as the top domain under which statistical learning falls, and then machine learning is a subset of that, uh, you know, deep learning, reinforcement learning, transfer learning, few shot learning, um, these are all then sort of uh, uh, subsets um, uh, of these, these, larger, these larger categories. Um, you know, one of the questions I always sort of get to is, is around, well, okay, so what about data science and big data? Um, is, data are, are, is data science the same thing as big data? Is big data the same thing as, as, as AI? And, and one way I sort of like to think about it is, um, absolutely, there's, there's, an, there's an intersection, right, uh, between data science and big data and artificial intelligence and all of these, these subdomains. But data science as a, as a field uh, and as a set of methods and tools also exists entirely outside of big data. Uh, as well as outside of, there's ways to, to apply data science um, that have nothing to do with AI or ML. Um, similarly, there are aspects of big data that have nothing to do with AI or ML or with data science for that matter. And so this is just kind of a nice visual, I think, to, to level set and kind of straighten out some of these things in our minds. So um, in case you weren't aware, <laughs> uh, AI in healthcare is a, is a wicked problem and wicked is actually a, a technical term and it represents this particularly difficult uh, class of problems that can be characterized by the 10 features that you see here in the, in the circles around the, the wicked problem. Um, and wicked problems, they are these sort of slippery, multidimensional, cross-disciplinary, often vague, uh, system-oriented problems that tend to fall deeply into these gray areas of human judgment. That's why they're wicked. That's why they're so hard. Um, just to give a couple of examples of um, uh, some AI problems in healthcare that would qualify as wicked. Uh, so here we have a, a, a chest x-ray, right? Uh, on the basis of this chest x-ray, right? First question might be, does the patient have pneumonia? Second question, is it is it COVID, right? Not a straightforward question to answer. Um, uh, 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 on the basis of um, uh, this set of, of uh, you know, uh, regular vitals that are being taken here on, on patients, does the patient need to be woken up in the middle of the night um, uh, in order to, to take another set of midnight vitals, or can they be allowed to sleep through the night and uh, have that restful, restorative sleep that will help them uh, recover and get out of the hospital sooner with, with better, better outcomes? It's not easy to see how you know, the data that you see in front of you directly leads to those kinds of questions or, or answers. And then um, another very important set of questions here is, you know, when should we begin goals of care conversations? Uh, um, and this is, these were models that were built during, um, during COVID. In fact, you know, all of these were models uh, that we've built at Northwell and, and have implemented there, um, the first one and the last one relative specifically to COVID. Um, uh, but when looking at uh, 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 COVID survival uh, and likelihood of survival, uh, uh, at what point in time is it appropriate to begin those, those goals of care conversations? Again, not immediately obvious on the basis of the, the graphs or the charts or the data that's, that's given. But despite these difficulties, I really want to um, go and emphasize that, that AI in healthcare is uh, saving lives today, right? Uh, whether it's saving lives in, in radiology, um, in oncology, cardiovascular risk segmentation, right? Intensivist sort of hospitalist care, among many, many others. And uh, I just sort of 
bouncing through a couple of different papers there. Each of those papers has a company behind them. Uh, they're they're in production uh, and all being being used out there. So uh, uh, AI in healthcare, right, uh, actually saves lives. Um, it's going to be important to remember this later as we go through the rest of this talk, right? Uh, um, uh, this is not just a, a insoluble wicked problem, but it is actually uh, uh, an importantly impactful one. So, um, but AI is not magical. Uh, you don't sort of simply sprinkle the, you know, the pixie dust of AI, right, on your hardest problems and they suddenly transform from wicked problems right into easy problems. Um, doing AI right is actually very hard. Uh, building models that work uh, on test data but fail in production is actually what is easy. And in fact, um, you know, the, the dirty little secret of AI that I sort of always like to tell people is um, if you give me or any competent data scientist an hour uh, with your data, we'll be able to give you 300 models. And, and certainly given the, the current um, uh, funding uh, 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 atmosphere paradigm, I, I, for at least 10 of those models, I'm sure I can get a million dollars in, in, in funding for it. It's, it's, it's not a hard thing um uh to to make these cool ai demos right the easy thing is in fact to make these cool ai demos but it is hard to make productizable ai models um uh in part because these models need to meet a whole variety of of, of different criteria they need to be reliable generalizable unbiased equitable explainable impactful scalable adaptable and i could go on on with that that list um you know, the, the good news is that we do know how to assess, uh, remediate, and actually deliver all of these in order to build well-engineered, productizable AI models that are commercializable to product markets. Um, doing this is, in fact, an, an engineering problem. And uh, while it is uh, an engineering problem that takes a lot of highly skilled people, putting in a lot of intense effort, supported by state-of-the-art technology and infrastructure, um, it's still a solvable engineering problem. But but all of that, um, to actually solve it, it does require a lot of, of capital. And so then that sort of raises the, the question, well, how do we go about uh, uh, raising that capital? Where does that money come from? So historically, sort of the way that we do this is by starting companies, um, uh, uh, you know, usually with the help of friends and family and, and our fellow founders. Um, uh, we get some initial promising results. We then go out to the, to the angels uh, or the accelerators, right? We, we raise some seed money. Then we start hiring more people. We start building more demos, right? We raise more money, usually uh, via venture capital in a, a series of VC rounds, right? Series A, Series B, Series C. Um, then we build and we scale that AI product. And, and eventually, um, uh, you know, we, we raise enough money that um, uh, we can go out and, and uh, do an IPO, right? Uh, backed by an investment bank. And then at last, um, we've sort of reached the scale and the impact where we can change the world for the better with our well-engineered productized AI. At least that's the that's the paradigm, um, or that's the the fairy tale to some extent. Um, but the ugly truth of startups is that that most startups don't don't survive. Um, in fact, only about one in six survive to a to a Series C, um, and uh, of those, only about one in six get acquired. So your joint probability there of getting to Series C and being acquired is roughly one in thirty six, right? And I'm sure the statisticians in the in the crowd. Uh, um, uh, we'll quibble over to just what extent, um, uh, 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 you know, getting acquired and getting to Series C are independent and identically distributed random variables. So, so one in 36 is probably on the high end. But, but even if it's if it's uh, one in 20, or even if it's one in 10, even the most prolific serial investor, uh, serial entrepreneurs, only start five or six companies in a lifetime. So the odds are are stacked against you. Um, that being said, being acquired is, of course, only one way to exit. Um, so what about going IPO? That's the other traditional way. Uh, well, you know, the, the data here are not a whole lot better. Um, of those companies that survive to Series C, your chances of exiting by an IPO are only about 1 in 25. So, so your overall chances of any kind of an exit, IPO or acquisition, and having survived to Series C is about 1 in 30. Again, you know, maybe you're talking now more like, like a, a 1 in 10, 1 in 15. Um, and uh, uh, but still, right? The odds are not in your favor uh, as a, as an entrepreneur. Um, important, right? That that uh, you know this is not the same as the cumulative chance of exiting by Series C, which would give you slightly better odds, but still, still not great. So, in looking at this table, right, you may have noticed this drop here, right, from seed uh, to Series A, and then and then it begins to bounce up, right? The reversal of that drop as we go from Series A to Series B and C and D and so on and so forth. And so what this really suggests is that going from C to Series A is remarkably difficult. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that as, as we go on here. But, you know, for those of you who are sort of incredulous and, and um, you're starting to say, you said, well, the numbers from the, from the previous slide and this slide don't really add up. 
Um, uh, just to be clear, right, uh, the table on this slide is the failure to raise the following round at each round, uh, whereas the previous chart uh, uh, were both cumulative probabilities up to a given round. So, so starting with the same data, just uh, displayed in slightly different ways and entirely congruent with each other, uh, they come from the same same studies and the same data sets. So, um, unfortunately, there isn't really good data on how many companies achieve financial stability and stay private, or how many sort of simply hit the end of their runway and, and go out of business. Um, but there's also some ugly truths about funding. Uh, this is a, a typical deal flow for a typical VC. And the first thing you should notice is there's a greater than 99% rejection rate. So even if there are 100 to 200 VCs, there aren't a thousand good startups with well-engineered productizable AI models. And so what you end up seeing is the same VCs end up chasing the same promising deals, often with multiple VCs participating in a given round. And this of course is part of why you see so many of these outsized investments in what appear to be overvalued companies. Um, it's also why, quite frankly, VCs expect most of their investments to fail and why they rely on just a handful of successes to make their overall multiples. It's also why all of their investments are managed to these very tightly myopic entry and exit criteria, um, uh, which they define as their thesis. Um, it's also why VCs don't really care about the long-term survival or impact of your company and your product. So long as they make their multiple before you flame out, it's all good to them. Um, now, sort of looking at digital health uh, deals over the last four years, this certainly bears it out. Uh, and this is some information that's sort of hot, hot off the presses here, right? Um, uh, you know, so much so that in fact, Series A in many ways um, is now the new Series B. Uh, so this is an analysis done by, by Rock Health. And what you can see here is that the, the average health tech Series B in 2017 is actually, or was actually a million dollars less than the average health tech Series A in, in 2021. And, and you know, while evident in, in the healthcare sector, it's not the only place you see this. Um, and furthermore, right, if you look closely, what you'll see too as well is that the companies getting funded in 2021 um, uh, were about a year and a half younger than the folks who were getting funded in, in 2017. So, so not only were the companies in 2017 more mature, farther along in their, their, uh, their product development process uh, and, and all the rest of it, um, but they were getting less money at the time. So, you know, this, this trend is driven almost entirely by this focus on, on exits, right? Uh, and in fact, um, there's a great New Yorker article from, from 2020 where, where Steve Blank, uh, who is a, an entrepreneur and well-known BC pioneer, currently teaching at Stanford University, had this, this great quote, right? I've watched this industry become a money-hungry mob. VCs today aren't interested in the public good. They're not interested in anything except optimizing their own profits and chasing the herd. And so they end up wasting billions of dollars that could have gone to innovation that, that actually helps people. And, and I think sort of for the ultimate expression of this, one need not look no farther than the special purpose acquisition company or the SPAC. Um, uh, most of you have probably heard of these. Uh, um, uh, you know, they are these sort of publicly traded shell companies which are capitalized on the basis of what they plan to acquire without having to specify what they actually will acquire, right? So, so in other words, these are, these are blank checks um, that have only one caveat or one kind of limit on them is that, that the money that goes into these SPACs has to be spent within a specified time period, usually about 18 months. But, but the whole point of a SPAC is, is really to quickly get capital to a company while avoiding the regulatory and public scrutiny that would go along with an IPO. And what this effectively does is give early investors an opportunity for, um, for a very profitable under the radar exit um, uh, because the valuations are gonna be driven by perception and not by fundamentals because there's no reporting, there's no requirement to report on those fundamentals. Um, that being said, you know, SPACs are likely to be a limited time offer as in part for, for you know, the reasons we just mentioned, um, there's a raft of new regulatory measures um, uh, being proposed to, to rein in the, the, the party as it were. Um, one final uh, semi-parenthetical note, uh, uh, while I haven't been able to find any good statistics on this, uh, but of what can be said of VC investors and investments, Roughly the same thing can be said to be true of angel investors, uh, although with even higher failure rates because angel investment is just a riskier place to, to start. Uh, and of course, there's no SPAC option for exit uh, in, in angels, uh, uh, at least yet. Uh, hopefully, um, hopefully that's not happening. That would be a bad sign. So uh, with all this capital sloshing around, it's a fair question. Why do, why do most startups not make it? Um, staff at CV Insights did a, a detailed postmortem on a, 111 of these failures. Um, and their analysis yielded the sort of top 12 reasons that you, you see over here. Um, note that most startups uh, gave more than one reason for their failure. And, and so these 12 percentages, if you add them up, won't add up to 100 as you would expect. Um, looking at these, clearly many of them uh, uh, relate to, to funding chasms uh, between investment stages. 
And, and these chasms really create these, these kind of wacky funding silos where there's these whipsaw entry and exit requirements between those silos. And those requirements really lead to a, a loss of focus and poor execution against the true goal of getting your well-engineered productizable AI model uh, out to a large commercial market, right? And you'll, you'll see this when, uh, when a company goes out for the next round of funding, um, the entire management team for somewhere between six and 18 months will be solely focused on presenting and pivoting the company uh, to meet the entry requirements of the, the um, investors they're looking to court. And then once they're, they're in that, that, that stage or that silo, um, uh, their company is driven to be managed towards the exit requirements of those investors, which is not being driven again towards getting that well-engineered productizable AI model out to a large commercial market. Um, on our way to a large commercial market, though, there, is, uh, there are other chasms. And another one that we find here is this chasm in tech adoption. This one is well known uh, between sort of the early and the mainstream market segments. You know, if you can't grab enough of the market, um, then, then you can't generate enough growth by any metric to justify that, that next round of investment. So we've got reasons that we can attribute to funding chasms. We have reasons that we can attribute to market adoption, to the market adoption chasm. There's also reasons that we can attribute to um, product management lifecycle. Uh, um, you know, building a product is easy relative to building a product that people not only want to buy, but that people actually will buy. And that's, that's really important to kind of um, uh, emphasize because those are three very different things. It's one thing to build a product. It's another thing to build a product that people want to buy, and yet it's something totally different to build a product that people actually will buy. And so this is standard product management um, uh, types, of, types of questions, but you should always be thinking about, are you solving a problem your customers care about? Is your marketing effective? Is your price point too high or too low? Um, you know, does your product differentiate from the rest of the market? Is your product defensible? How broad is your moat? And on and on, all these types of questions. Um, so uh, we've got reasons that we can attribute to funding chasms. Uh, we have reasons that we can attribute to the market adoption chasm. We have reasons that we can attribute to the product management lifecycle chasm. And these really all seem to sort of tangle and intertwine and, and align into a, into a Gordian knot known as the traction gap. Um, you can have the best product in the world, but if you can't get traction, you're going to be relegated to the margins of that market and you're, you're likely to go out of business. Um, the traction gap can't be escaped, right? It's a fundamental part of company and product life cycles. Uh, but it is made worse, and I would argue much, much worse, by the siloed whipsaw funding models that we, that we currently use. But remember, right, as we said early on in the talk, right, AI in healthcare saves lives, right? You're trying to get your well-engineered AI model out to a broad market uh, as a commercial product because it saves lives, right? In fact, it's almost a moral imperative to get your AI model to the broadest market possible as quickly as possible. If your company fails to exit, if you fail to secure the next round of funding, if you fail to scale, or you go out of business for any reason, it's not overstating it to say people who could have lived will die, right? People's health and well-being are literally on the line in healthcare. So we really have to find a better way to, to solve this problem. So uh, here at Northwell, uh, right, we believe that we've solved this problem by uh, what we call horizontalizing our investment strategy where we align uh, with Northwell Health's three uniquely differentiable and defensible assets, namely the scale of our data, the depth of our clinical expertise, and the breadth of our healthcare implementation platform. We identify internal gaps in care, operational inefficiencies, or administrative needs that have real impact and cost associated with them, making sure that those gaps or inefficiencies you know, and or needs generalize to other healthcare institutions, right? that they're not just Northwell problems. We find partners with AI-enabled technologies, products, or services that have the potential to solve these gaps or inefficiencies or needs, or if no suitable partner exists, then we look to our own internal innovation. We then invest our data, uh, our expertise, and our healthcare implementation platform in return for equity, revenue share, joint IP, advisory positions, and, and so on, all the same sorts of things that we would be part of a traditional capital investment. Um, uh, we use a repeatable, scalable, transparent, evidence-based pipeline that delivers these you know, well-engineered, productizable AI algorithms with broad market appeal that solve problems in healthcare that providers and patients actually care about. Um, you know, this, this streamlined pipeline, it de-risks the subsequent capital investments in the company by demonstrating in a methodologically rigorous way that the AI algorithms actually work as part of clinical workflows and that they deliver hard outcomes and measurable value in the real world. Of course, there's still gonna be failures, uh, not every AI algorithm survives the, the rigorous validation of the, of the pipeline, uh, and many companies still won't successfully clear the chasms that make up that, that traction gap, uh, but your odds of succeeding will, of course, be, be dramatically improved. And 
really the last piece of this story is um, uh, on October 27th, uh, Northwell Health and, and uh, uh, the startup studio Aegis Ventures, uh, we announced a, a partnership to develop, scale and launch AI driven healthcare companies. Um, the intent of this partnership is to bring uh, our joint resources together, the clinical expertise of Northwell and the commercialization capabilities of Aegis, and to develop AI companies that, that address issues in, in, in healthcare quality, health equity, um, and many of the other crises that exist in, in healthcare. Um, the intent here is to bring together clinicians and researchers and patients and payers to identify the most pressing problems that, that need to be addressed today. Uh, as part of this, Aegis intends to invest at least $100 million of seed stage funding uh, through the partnership to catalyze uh, sort of a significant multiple of that amount from the venture capital uh, and, and broader investment community, ultimately accelerating both the, 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 the speed with which new life-saving AI solutions can can reach the patient bedside. So this really helps to, it's a, a, a chocolate and peanut butter story um, uh, or a better together story uh, uh, where we can bring together the sustained uh, capital investments, the commercialization expertise of, of Aegis uh, and really blend that across the entire product management life cycle and, and uh, uh, AI, AI product life cycle uh, along with our data, our expertise and the, the implementation platform that we, we've got. So in, in summary, because um, uh, not everyone necessarily is in healthcare, but I, I do believe almost everyone uh, uh, has, uh, your company does have some type of mission, some type of ethical imperative. Find that, find and define what that ethical imperative is. Um, uh, align your assets. Think about those things that you can uniquely bring to bear against that ethical, that ethical imperative. Uh, go out and find those passionate partners, whether those partners are gonna be bringing uh, uh, capital or whether they're gonna be bringing products uh, and services um, or other capabilities, right? Find those passionate partners who are passionate about your shared vision. Pay very close attention to the, to the gaps, to that traction gap that, that exists for everything that you're gonna be uh, looking to do. And think about how you can horizontalize your, your investments um, uh, to really help bridge those gaps and get to a more successful outcome on the other side. And then, and then finally, um, uh, uh, recognize that, that you're making margin to support your mission, right? Not the other way around. The mission is not to make margin that we are making margin to support the mission, right? So it's really all about how will you change the world and in short, uh, doing well by, by doing good. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there, uh, Dale, and we can sort of open up the, uh, the, the conversation and, and any questions that um, uh, we might wanna take from the audience. Yeah, you bet, Bryn. Well, we, uh, Mark and I coordinated on 10 questions ahead of time that we, might ask and uh, but I have five new ones that we didn't coordinate on that I'd rather ask how about that friend? perfect put me on the spot yeah the um, and we should probably take some if there we'll wait to see if there's any uh, from the audience here but but let's seriously let's go back to a couple of questions that we did coordinate prior yeah um, you know the we talked about the Lancet and the British Medical Journal and the reviews that they did on primarily COVID related AI. Yeah. And over between the two journals, they evaluated over 400 different implementations of AI, and none of them passed clinical tests of viability. Yeah. For deployability, widespread use, and that kind of thing. What's your reaction to that, friend? What do you think about that? So, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a great question, right? And, and I think it's, it's indicative of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, well, let's make it a positive thing, of, of where we could do better uh, in, in AI, right? I think it's primarily due to a lack of, of rigor in that validation and not just, not just model validation, um, uh, right, but solution validation, clinical validation, validation of the business models that go along with that. Um, and, and that really requires not only uh, data science, but also a very deep implementation science um, and, and pretty robust data product management. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really gonna be a core competency of this, this Aegis Northwell uh, uh, partnership that we have um, is this, this, this capability to really be uh, absolutely um, uh, uh, world-class, uh, uh, transparent, evidence-based, uh, um, you know, rigor in everything that we do. Um, you know, so not only is there gonna serve this extensive uh, internal and, and external retrospective validation, you know, sort of that numerical validation, if you will, but also really doing extensive internal and external prospective validation, right? So, so really putting it into practice, right? Um, 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 monitoring and measuring the impact of those uh, uh, and, and doing that in a way um, that is again, uh, defined against these hard outcomes, 
um, um, you know, defined value models um, and doing that in a variety of sort of pre and post um, pre and post designs, right? Um, such that that you know, if you're a prospective buyer, you're actually going to be able to do your own data driven internal analysis to determine whether or not you and your organization um, uh, are going to be able to take a solution that, that we've built, right? And whether that's actually going to provide value uh, for your patients, your patients, right? Not our patients, but your patients um, in your clinical workflows, um, uh, right? With your providers, right? And on timeframes that are meaningful to you and, and your institution, right? So the intent is really um, uh, to make solution assessment and, and, and implementation uh, uh, processes much more rational uh, and based on merit and, and impact. Yeah. I think there might be sort of the rush to publish, you know, AI is a hot topic. So there's some incentive to publish just in that world, right? And then of course, COVID being what it was, everyone was, I think with good intent, willing to maybe publish a little too early. Yeah. Uh, and I think so you combine sort of the emotional attachment to publishing an AI prematurely with the well-intended, you know, attempts to improve COVID, I think it combined for some pretty bad press, but you did a good job bringing out some of the cases that are working. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, how, do we want to bring up that diagram that we've sketched? Oh yeah, sure. I think that'd be great. Yeah. You want to do that? And because yeah. I think maybe now would be the time to do it because I think part of the problem is, and, th and those of us that have been around for a while, and I count us in that category, yeah. we've weathered a few storms. You know, I'm, you're a lot more current on AI than I am. I'm still, I still stay in touch with it, but I certainly can't program in it, but I was definitely deep in it in the nineties. There's a, there's an appropriate use of AI in the overall flow of decision-making. And I think sometimes we rush to this very narrow application of AI without thinking about kind of the life cycle of AI as it relates to overall decision making and data analysis. So I think that was kind of the basis for the conversation that prompted our um, sketch, right, friend? Absolutely. And, and let me just bring that up here so we can share that with, with everybody. Um, so let's go ahead and put this up here and we'll make that large. Go ahead and share the screen again. And I believe that is all right. So hopefully, uh, oh, the, which are you seeing the screen down here? Uh, it's starting to show up. Yep. There it is. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah, no. So I, I think this is, uh, you, you know, it, Right. And obviously, you know, you and I, we talk regularly and we just kind of, you know, uh, bandy about ideas. Right. And, and kind of talk about where we see things, see things going. And this this I thought was um, I think we both thought was was sort of one of our one of our better conversations. And, and uh, while this is not rocket science and I think I think neither of us would want to go and put this out as some transformative paradigm and uh, or framework in 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 uh, in AI. Right. That that uh, is going to change the way we do it. It is sort of a set of, of best practices, or at least a framework against which um, uh, we all too often kind of get caught up in the excitement and the speed and the urgency of the work that we're doing, and we kind of forget some of the some of the steps that that, that we should be taking. Um, and so this this uh, came out almost more as like a checklist uh, kind of approach, where mm -hmm. we want to be thinking about um, you know whether it's a, a, an effort you're doing at IMO or I'm doing with you know Northwell or Aegis or, or any one of our listeners is doing um, uh, with any of their projects. Um, uh, we'd want to, um, we'd want to, uh, just sort of pull this up and think about it a little bit to make sure it, you know, what you're doing makes sense. Um, and so, so hopefully folks can, can see this and it's, it's large enough, right? But, but in general, right, we were sort of talking about things that really sort of begin with this, this, uh, exploring phase, right? Um, in traditional data science, you might think of it as, as your exploratory data analysis. Um, and it's really where you're, you're, um, you're thinking about things like, well, what are the concepts, the conceptual frameworks that we're that we're working with, right? How well does our data align or map to those to those frameworks? How well does our data support that? Um, and quite frankly, actually, concept validity was something that confused me for a long time until someone gave me a really simple example of it, right? Um, and and that's something like uh, like poverty, right? So poverty is a concept. It's not a thing, right? Mm -hmm. and there's no wand I can wave over a person or a country or a household. It's the poverty meter that reads out a number between zero and 100 or on some meaningful scale. Poverty is a concept and there's a bunch of different sort of proxies and ways that we use, you know, 
um, a, 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 you know, average sort of, um, a, you know, a gross domestic product or, or you know, a per um, per capita or disposable income, you know, by household or any of these, uh, or, or disease burden, right? We come up with all of these different proxies to try and get at poverty, but there's no, the data, there's no data that says um, this is a poor, this is a poor country or a poor person or a poor household and this one, this one isn't. Um, and so thinking about what those concepts are, because most of the concepts we care about are exactly that, you know, another concept would be uh, heart disease, right? Again, there's no, there's no wand I wave over you that says you are a four on the heart disease scale, right? Um, mm. There's a variety of different pieces of data that we collect that we assemble into this concept of, of heart disease. And then we, we break it up into a variety of different kinds of heart disease based on what we see in that, in that data. So, so it's very much the field that we're working in. So, so thinking a lot about that, um, what is, the, is the data available? I know one of the things you've talked about a lot as being very important is um, data quality. And I completely agree on this, right? And really kind of going back to, to first principles that it's a garbage in, garbage out if you don't address that well. But, 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 so to... but I would also say in the, in, the, in the workflow and the thoughtfulness of AI, if you've got crappy data, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to apply AI. It just means you need to be careful about how you apply it. Yep. And yeah. so it, it's all about, I'm not, you know, when I kind of opine about data quality, I'm not saying, well, because we have data quality, we should put the brakes on and we shouldn't do anything with AI until we clean up our data. No, that's not the case. In fact, you know, both of us know coming from this world, crappy data is actually a pretty good place to um, utilize AI because it handles anomalies and data quality problems better than traditional declarative programming, right? Yeah. But you just have to be wise about what the results are telling you, right? Yeah, no, and that, that's, a, that's a great point. That's a great segue to, to phase two, but I also want to make a, another great point in that, um, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the analogies I always like to use is, is gravity, right? So there's a ton of different ways to measure gravity, right? We can collect a lot of different data about it. We can do it by sort of measuring shadows and pendulums, or we can be dropping weights at different heights, or we can be doing it in vacuums, you know, all these different data sets, which will capture it to greater or, or lesser fidelity, but it doesn't matter how we come at it or kind of how um, uh, messy our data set is, it's always gonna contain that gravity signal in it, right? I mean, unless it's just a truly horrible data set, right? Um, or completely unrelated to, 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 to gravity. And so I often like to think of, you know, we should be trying the same same things, right? Start with that messy data, um, you know, this phase two that we're talking about here, start with various types of unsupervised uh, approaches, right? Whether it's, it's you know, sort of clustering or, um, or some of these other approaches to begin to try and understand what are the patterns? What is the structure of your data? Let the data kind of speak to you um, and look for those signals, recognizing that that um, you're going to get a lot of arbitrary signals and you're going to get a lot of wrong signals. But but as you're using different algorithms, as you're using different data sets, as you're coming at a concept like poverty or heart disease from different angles, if there's a there there like gravity, it should show up. The majority of the ways you come at it yeah. should show there's something there, right? And then that really allows you to create these very um, and this is phase three, right? Those very focused um, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, 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 specific hypotheses around segments um, and and uh, uh, and patterns that make sense to you as a human based on the knowledge base that you have, um, or that look intriguingly novel, right? And such as you might want to investigate them as as a paradigm shifting or a, a new way to think about the problem. And then that really moves into the phase four that we had, which is where you're doing the rigorous hypothesis testing. Um, mm -hmm. That falls much more into this sort of supervised um, uh, uh, classification, and strictly speaking, it's not clustering, right? Clustering is a is an unsupervised thing. So you can tell we we threw this together, right? Um, but 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 again, it, like I said, it's, it's a framework for us to kind of kind of think through things, and and um, and it's not the only way to do it. There's other ways to to do it as well. But but I would I would argue there's probably not a project that wouldn't benefit. I'm just kind of thinking through these phases or approaches, right? As you're sort of thinking about what what you want to what you want to do, um, and then you know, finally, if you survive that rigorous validation process uh, that would occur in that phase four, you can now um, really start to move it into production, observe how it's working in production, AI, ML ops, and 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 all that kind of kind of work, and right? it sort of, in many ways, mirrors the you know the, the sort of um, um, scientific method and the cycles of the scientific method and you know, continually refining your your ideas. Uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan of, of Bayesian approaches as well. I think um, I think 10, 15, 20 years. I think we we've suffered under under 200 years, uh, well, 100 years of Sir Ronald Fisher and his um, his uh, frequentist obsession 
a lot of great information. The reason we're able to have this conversation today and the webinar is working and we're all alive, or at least the three quarters of us are alive, are, are almost entirely due to linear regression and Ronald Fisher and frequentism. So I don't want to take anything away from that or frequentist divergence statistics. But uh, Bayesian is enormously powerful, can teach us a ton of stuff. Um, there's some fantastic information theoretic approaches to statistics as well. And we do well to, to, to make those part of our armamentarium, if you will, as we're trying to get closer and closer to truth. Uh, because yeah. No truth with a capital T, just approximation. And I, you, <laughs> yeah, right, with a capital T. You know what I see too is a rush towards predictive models and AROC scores, right? So, in fact, this, like you said, this is not rocket science here. It's just sort of common sense. And if if folks were deliberately sort of thinking about these steps, I'm pretty sure we would have better output, less hype, more reality out of AI and healthcare. But, yeah. but what I have observed, and you know, maybe I'm guilty to some degree of allowing this to happen in my roles, is we rush to predictive models. There's nothing like this that preceded our love affair with pre uh, predictive models and AROC scores, right? And we both know that AROCs, you can, I mean, AROC scores can be meaningless and super misleading, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 you, so you remember, and hopefully everyone in the audience can, can repeat along with me, what is the dirty little secret of machine learning and AI, right? You give me an hour with your data and I'll give you 300 models that fit the data really, really well, right? right. It's, not, it's not hard to build a model with a, with a good, um, uh, a good, good, you know, AUC of any kind, right? Whether it's a, you know, PRC or, or, or AUC or whatever, or, or, um, or RSC, uh, whatever the case might be. Uh, and in fact, it, it's not even particularly hard to get, um, you know, good, uh, good accuracy scores or any, any of a variety of these other scores that are out there. Uh, there's a lot of ways to sort of game the system. And in fact, um, you know, when I was uh, uh, teaching data science, one of the one of the things I always hammered home was for any model that you build, if it's, you know, whether it's your R squared uh, or it's your um, or it's your AUC, if, you, if it's 0.99, it's too good to be true, right? In fact, almost certainly right. anything other than about 0.95 or 0.96, you haven't done the concept validity piece appropriately, and you've got some kind of label leakage, right? So something about the target that you're trying to predict, right, has 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 leaked from the, the target piece of the model into the into the features, right, into the input of the model, and it's super yeah. easy to have that to have that happen. Um, uh, you, again, I mean, unless unless you're building a predictive model for gravity, right? F equals M A, right? That I would believe you could get a you know pretty close to a 0.999, right? But yeah, uh, but that's um, so. there's a message from someone there. Thank you for a very productive discussion. Uh, let's see, I had another thought here about um, so, oh, let's talk about data monetization and algorithm value. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been doing a fair amount of lectures and consulting, trying to help organizations and even governments figure out what's the value of their data. Yeah. And then subsequently, what's the value of an algorithm? Now, you know, with Northwell and Aegis together, yeah. what are your thoughts there, friend? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a great question. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think, I think, Probably one of the most important questions uh, that that we're going to ask uh, uh, in this partnership, uh, when we're sort of looking at at um, uh, uh, you know the intake process and, and and pipelines and all the rest of it is is literally so what um, right so what yeah you know, it, it comes right back to this this point that again we said right it's easy to create these cool AI demos but it's really really hard to create these impactful uh, broadly generalizable AI products right so so one of the places we always sort of start is we just like okay. So let's assume for a moment that for any given question or opportunity, um, uh, for any given gap in care or operational efficiency or administrative need, let's assume that we have a, a perfect or or a perfect enough AI model. So what? Then what? Mm. What does that mean? What does that do? Right? Um, what will the output of that model change in a care pathway? Right? To whom does that output need to be presented, and and how does it need to be presented to cause? And I put cause in in, in quotes there because causality is a, is a is a fraught term, but to cause that change or drive that change. Um, what is the clinical impact of that change? Is the net clinical impact beneficial, and if so, to whom? Right? Because the the benefits and the harms do not always accrue evenly, and that's not mm -hmm. just an equity piece. That can also be across different stakeholders. Um, there can be, you know, uh, uh, benefits to one group, uh, you know, you know, benefits to a patient and harm to providers, right? It's certainly mm -hmm. a possible outcome. Um, uh, um, 
what is the financial impact of that change, right? And now we're beginning to sort of get into the business model aspects of it, right? Because I would I would love that we lived in a world where uh, where money didn't matter and and um, uh, we could practice care to the top of our ability and everybody got every test that was necessary, but that's just not the way the the world works, right? Someone has to pay for the MRI, someone has to pay for the um, uh, mm -hmm. you know the hypodermic needle, someone has to pay for the building in which all and the lights uh, and the electricity in which all these things uh, occur under. So. So um, what is the financial impact of that change? To, to, to whom do the cost savings under the new revenue accrue? Because oftentimes you'll find, especially in these wicked problems, one part of the organization will incur a cost and another part of the organization will, will get the benefit, will get the revenue. And you have to sort of solve that problem, right? Because oftentimes it's the people who are incurring the cost are the ones who are implementing it or deploying it. And unless some, some, there's some mechanism for that revenue to flow back to them, um, given the financial pressures that all the health systems and, and the medicine is under these days, it's just not really feasible to ask them to pony up um, time and effort and money um, that could potentially put them out of business. So, you know, um, another way of thinking about this is, right, is there's some care pathway that that individual is on. Uh, we inject this information. We now move to a, an alternate care pathway. Okay, so, you know, this is sort of the counterfactual. But but who bears the cost of the alternate care pathway? Again, similar question, but slightly different. Um, whether those costs or the costs in that alternate the care pathway are financial or emotional or, or, or temporal, right, time or, or effort, who's putting the effort in, um, and, and so on. Um, and is that different from, from who recognizes the benefits, right? So that so, that so what question um, uh, is just such a uh, you know, tremendously important piece of this, right? Um, and I, a lot of people just don't ask that question. They just don't think about it. And, and quite frankly, they don't have to because there's so much frothiness in the market right now. If you spin a good story and you have a couple of a couple of exciting algorithms and you've got a little bit of an implementation arm um, that's, you know, where on the basis of some internal study, right, that no one can tell you what it was. Uh, oh, oh, you know, uh, we reduced readmissions by 52%. Yeah. But, but, but you know, there's this gets back at experimental design and sort of basic science, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that in data science, I always emphasize the science piece and not the data piece, right? Data science is about science. It's about the science of data and how you do that data. Method and yeah, being deliberate about your biases and yeah. right. Yeah. 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 You know, methodological rigor and clarity of thought, right? And that's, again, that's, that's central to our, our, our vision and belief and, and uh, core values at, at Northwell, as well as to the, the partnership with Aegis. That's Speaking of Northwell, how is Northwell and Aegis, how are they going to avoid being part of the froth and the, uh, what was the quote you said, the mob? Uh, uh, right, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, uh, and the was, distraction, right. I would also add that there's distraction in the market. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. I mean, there's like healthcare providers and life sciences and others are being inundated with these AI pitches, right? a lot of times to decision makers that don't have a background to make a decision frankly and that's a distraction every time we make a wrong decision so how are you what are you guys going to do to be the better player in the market yeah so so, so there's there's really uh, two answers to that and and the, the first answer is is sort of the easier one right and it's one we, we already talked a little bit about and that's you know by by doing this this um this validation you know, as a methodologically rigorous, transparent, evidence-based pipeline where we surface all of the same information and where we, in fact, implemented it first in-house, right, against hard outcomes and, 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 and defined value models, um, we're showing you exactly how we thought about it. We're, we're showing you the exact method that we use and, and, and we're showing you the, the processes and the workflows that it impacted and, and the challenges that we had to go through, the implementation science piece, the um, the um, uh, the uh, uh, any sorts of, of culture change or, or uh, change management processes that had to go along with it. Because again, that's part of what makes these problems wicked. You, this is not just something you can simply throw something at and it, it's gonna be fixed. You have to think of them in a system-wide way. And the only way you can really, really um, begin to crack that is with, is with data, right? And so now a potential buyer or someone who's interested in it can go and read this sort of standardized documentation, right? And go and see exactly what we did go and apply it to your institution, be as methodologically rigorous as you want to be where you are, see if it provides value. And and again, if it, you know, if it's going to cost you X dollars to implement and it's going to return, um, you know, X dollars plus Y benefit on top of that, then it's a no brainer to, to, to purchase the, the software, or the product to implement it because you already know it's going to work. There's nothing hidden. You're not taking a guess or a, or a bet. So that's, yeah. that's, that's one piece of it. Um, you know, there's, there's another piece of it, which is, um, you know, you can be a little bit cynical about it and say, well, yeah, but at the end of the day, right, um, you know, you're not, 
you know, we're not just putting all of our discoveries up online and, and um, you know, publishing them for the world to, to, to use and see, right? It's not like sort of Tesla putting, you know, all their patents up for, for public consumption, um, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're mandated to, to, to make a return here, but again, it's, you know, making that margin to support the mission, not, not the mission to make, to make margin. And so, so for us, the reason we can stand behind these things uh, um, is again, because of that, that rigorous, transparent, evidence-based pipeline that we build, right? And so we can say, look, this is how it worked for us. Um, we recognize it may or may not work for you, but if it works for you, you know, we're happy to, to share our experience and, and our, uh, our, our value there. And, and knowing that Northwell is always going to be connected with that product or service because it's providing value for us and solving that need. It's making uh, patients' lives better. It's making providers' lives better. Um, it's, you know, making the, the health system as a whole run better. Um, we're always going to have a stake in making sure that that that, um, that product or that service or that company, uh, uh, you know, continues to, to to deliver on that that promise of of doing um, doing well by doing good. I have a theory that we've entered the the age. Well, I'll, let me back up. We figured out how to calculate commodity prices for oil and wheat and various grades of quality of those products, right? Yep. We haven't figured this out with data yet. And so it's going to be, I think, fascinating from a macroeconomics perspective to see how data monetization and algorithm monetization evolve. Um, and there, I gave a lecture recently about data, how to calculate data monetization values and things. And I just used case studies of companies that had sold or been acquired and the data they had, you know, on a per record basis, what did that equate to? By the way, just so if anybody's curious, the Roche acquisition of Flatiron was the far outlier on a per record basis, but Roche paid for Flatiron way, way higher than anything else in the in the in the uh, use cases I looked at. All right, you know what, friend? We better we better ask some questions of the audience here, and so I stop the, the dominating here. Um, is this the Joe Boyce that I know? Is that you, Joe? Uh, anyway, Joe Boyce is asking a question. Um, how do you see liability for I AI recommendations evolving? I doubt the VCs will be on the hook. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great. Oh, it is, Joe. Hey, Joe, good to see you, friend. Thanks. <laughs> good to hear your voice out there. Okay. Yeah. So who's going to be at, yeah, at risk for this, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we can come back uh, uh, and do another hour-long presentation on on ethics and, and AI, and and I mean, it's and it's an enormously important problem, and and I, I don't want to make it seem like we're at all, um, or I'm at all, or the Northwell or Aegis are at all sort of flippant about it, or 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 um, uh, uh, brushing it to the side. It, it's it's absolutely at the core of, of everything that we do, and it's it's part of the mission, and, and the only reason. Uh, we can engage um, uh, in these kinds of efforts is because we do believe very strongly um, that it can be done ethically, it can be done fairly, right? We can get more just, more equitable um, uh, outcomes on the other side. Now, an important piece of that is is absolutely, you know, it's going to go wrong, right? Um, there there will be there there will be times um, when it gets it wrong. Um, and oh, right. Boeing flight control system is essentially AI, and look at what happened there, right? Giant yeah. liability. Now, in, in that case, and I want to be very, very, very careful, um, that type of thing should never happen with, with Aegis and Northwell uh, because there were very clear um, uh, uh, issues with chain of command and, and pressure and quality control and all the rest of it that, that led to that, right? There were plenty of signals leading up to that that very clearly said, you know, um, yeah. uh, Boeing's not, you know, this, this uh, the Dreamliner, right, was not ready to fly yeah. yet. Yeah, uh, and they were just sort of ignored. That's that's something we would never do. And in fact, that's again part of the whole point of making. We don't want to wait for the lawsuit for all that information to become transparent, right? That's the right. wrong way to do it, right? That all of that gets surfaced right up front. And so, so the you know the buyer has the choice of making the decision: is this is this too risky for me? Uh, is the benefit does the benefit outweigh the the risk enough for me and all the rest of it? And and, and again, that's not a way of saying we would ever build a, a knowingly faulty product, right? So it's absolutely not what we would do. Um, but but it, it is a the more the, the larger point there, which I think is one that that as a society we need to have a conversation on, and we need to include as many voices as possible in that conversation. Is is you know look we've we've encountered this before, right? Guess what? Humans make mistakes, right? Um, uh, doctors make mistakes. Pilots make mistakes. We all we all make mistakes. 
um, automated mechanical systems make mistakes um, uh, and occasionally break and do the, do the wrong thing. Um, so, so we've, we've dealt with these problems before and we found ways to be comfortable with them, right? And, you know, when we're comfortable having an intersection, you know, we'll, we'll wait until a certain number of accidents or fatalities occurred in an intersection before we'll pay to put up a stoplight, right? Now, I'm, I'm not arguing that that's how we should be looking at AI. In fact, I think that's the wrong way to look at AI. I'm just trying to, to make the point that, that we tend to have this very emotional reaction to AI that's not really based in, in not rooted in history, it's not rooted in how we've handled regulation and liability historically for, for similar technologies and similar approaches. And, and so I think we just need to have that, we need to have that very, um, uh, and I hope I don't get flamed too hard for this, right? We just need to have a grown up conversation about it, right? And, and recognize yeah. that mistakes will happen. And not all mistakes are, um, uh, uh, are someone's fault, right? Well, and I, I think a lot of the way that, you know, having been involved in, some sophisticated risk analysis when I was at NSA. I came away from that experience with the notion of defendability of the process. You know, it, it our society is enormously forgiving. If you can show good intent and defendability of what you did to get to where you were that might have created an accident. And frankly, the, the framework that we just described, if people would follow that, mm -hmm. And, and if something happened as a consequence after following that, you'd go back and go, well, man, we really tried. Yeah. yeah. So I think at some point there will be more oversight from FDA, Health and Human Services. I'm not quite sure where it's going to come from. Uh, that and will require the law, right? The, the, yeah, the law will emerge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A little bit left. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more with all of that. Right? It's um, uh, it's a it's a it's a tough series of questions, but we've handled tough questions before as 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 a species, um, and we've we've gotten to places where, as a species, we're comfortable with largely comfortable with the outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and so I think okay, let me add here. I'll, here's another question in the in the interest of humor and transparency. This is a question that came up early, and I'll I'll share with you my answer. This presentation is absurd. Is this the agenda for the rest of the presentation? Why is this guy talking about company funding and success rate? He's a data scientist. I said, he's an investor too, and don't be rude. Feel free to drop. He's spending his time for your benefit. Uh, okay, <laughs> so thankfully the other feedback is a lot more positive. Yeah. All right, Brent. So uh, let me go to this one here and i can stay a little bit over if you well, and let me let me just sort of quickly re respond to that uh, as well because yeah, it, you know. it is a valid point right you, you may well have showed up for this expecting us to sort of talk through frameworks and and um uh tool sets uh for for equity and inclusion and diversity and and um right. uh, better better ways to validate and train your deep neural networks and i i get all of that right and that's um but quite frankly, there's a there's a ton of that out there, right? Um, uh, uh, what people aren't really talking about is is how you get your model out to the world, right? Yeah, um, that's kind of exactly it. It's how you get the model out to the world that's as important as a data scientist is the algorithms. Yeah, right. Exactly, and that's yeah. the. And again, I, I have nothing. I have no problem with people who say, "Well, I just want to do the data scientist." Beautiful. I love those folks. I love data science as well. Um, but that's got to be hooked up to, you know, you could write the great American novel, but if it sits in a cave somewhere and no one ever reads it, does it matter, right? I mean, you know, right. and so you, you want to... I'm always open to criticism. People that know me know it, but I also don't like armchair quarterbacks. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, especially when you're trying to do good things, Mark. So, yeah, I just, that's how I feel. I'm comfortable feeling that way. Yeah. Um, and I, I welcome criticism, right? It only, it only makes things... It, it only makes things better, right? I mean, if you're going to be a scientist, right, and you're going to really approach things truly as a scientist, you have to be always be ready to give up your most closely held belief in the face of new evidence. And you also have to really encourage people to come at you with the harshest criticisms and critiques that you could think of. Because that's the yeah. only way you find the flaws in your reasoning. And that's the only way you get, you know, get step by step closer to that, to finer and finer approximations of truth with a capital T. Yeah, so, I agree, buddy. I agree. Okay, here's a great question. I'm still trying to understand how AI can leverage messy data without putting a hold on AI initiatives. Could you please provide an example on this? I can provide a real world example while you're thinking, friend. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, 
So I grew up in the national intelligence space in the military AI world, right? Where, I mean, the data is crazy messy and super complicated. There's no notion of, you know, fire data models or OMOT data models to kind of constrain what you're looking at. Um, and so by very nature, we applied pattern recognition, especially unsupervised pattern recognition to data to generate hypotheses about what was happening in a situation. And in, in their very specific example, this is how we identified and made a connection uh, between East Germany and Libya as a, uh, in the attack on a, on a Berlin discotheque that killed a number of US service people this was during the Reagan administration. And I can tell you for sure, I mean, super messy data environment, but we applied pattern recognition over several different data sets and combine those. And what emerged from that was a pattern of communication between Libya and East Germany that we had never seen before that mm -hmm. preceded the attack on the discotheque in, in Berlin. That was the moment that clarified to me, you can have messy data and what you can do with unsupervised clustering is express information to humans so they can generate better, faster hypotheses sooner. That's basically what it comes down to is like, I call them, a lot of AI now, I think, is a hypothesis generation platform. It's not an answer, it's a hypothesis. You know, okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly certainly part of it, right? A hypothesis generation, I think, is an, is an important piece, but it's also it's also the sort of the rigorous hypothesis uh, validation components as well. So so I don't want to say it's sort of, it, you need both, right? And then there's also the predictive component and the effector arm and, and how it goes. But, but one thing I think that's fascinating about the, the point that you just brought up there is one way to look at that would be, um, well, uh, you know, so you found this new connection, obviously you sort of found the connection after the fact and were able to go and see it. And now that's a new, a new finding that you can use to sort of prevent future attacks or see future suspicious activities, which is fantastic. But, but someone could certainly have come along and said, well, you had all the data there, right? And the, the bombing happened. I'm gonna hold you responsible, right? To go back to that, to that um, you know, who's going to be AI and who, who we should sue or not sue. And I think that's a perfect example of a situation where, where no one's at fault, right? That was a correlation that we didn't know yeah. existed that time right. right it was a pattern that, that hadn't yet been found and some of these patterns you can only see after the bad event has, has happened right and, mm -hmm. and quite frankly that's that's also part of the way knowledge has always worked right um uh mm -hmm. and medicine right something awful happens uh three or four times and a clinician goes and says you know these three or four awful things that happened i seem to see the same three things preceding them so i'm going to say the thing that precedes them is the cause of the awful thing and i'm going to give it my name and it's you know going to be it's going to be the the you know the the, the Sanders parody syndrome and and we'll go forward from there right um, mm -hmm. so, so that's part of the way that and, and we just we, we can't um, hold people liable when they're at fault like the Boeing example clearly people at fault clearly negligence but but there's times when we just don't know what we what we don't know right and and I don't think the right exam the right answer is to go and say well we should just never look at at that. Um, at that that communications data, we should just never apply those models, right? Uh, we should just close our eyes and 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 you know bombings are just going to happen, and we should just let them happen, right? Again, to sort of play off that that mm -hmm. same example, right? I mean, that's that would kind of be the analogy, right? So so absolutely, if it's messy data, dive in, right? And and see what the data seems to be telling you, and then test those hypotheses. Um, well, and the other thing that can happen from from that approach is that you can actually step back and say, you know what? we can't see anything. And so we need to circle back and get more data, right? So it, it can actually be sort of a data quality journey in itself. You know, one of the, the mentors that I had early in my career in this space would always say, let the model fluctuate around the data, mm -hmm. right? And, and so anytime we started trying to impose too much structure or too much of an a priori model around data, he would just come back and say, look, just let the data talk to you. Don't impose a model on the data. Don't impose a framework on the data. Um, let it talk to you. And I do worry that sometimes in healthcare where we're trying to impose models like FHIR and OMOP and things like that on data that wasn't generated that way. Yeah, ab ab absolutely, right? Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I would take it sort of even, even one step farther to go back to some of the things we had talked about early in, in, in this talk too around concept validity, right? Because really what you're talking about is don't become so rigidly fixed to a set of concepts or so rigidly fixed to a set of beliefs that you, you lose the ability to, to see new patterns, right, and new features and um, to, to, to move things forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's, 
uh, and I'm just going to pick one small example, um, or it's a very large example, but, but, you know, but so for instance, you look at something like um, Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia associated with it, right? And it's um, um, defined uh, 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 pathologically by, um, you know, a, a tau protein and beta amyloid, um, you know, plaque sort of uh, angles in the brain. Um, and so for a long time, we sort of said, well, those are, you know, that's clearly the end point, that's clearly the cause, and, and it may or may not be, we actually still don't know one way or another, but my point is more that that if from the outside, before you go inside, you just sort of take dementia as a whole, there's a whole bunch of different ways to end up at dementia as an end point, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, there's probably a whole bunch of very separate diseases that all lead to the same uh, pathological, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 clusters and, and tangles, right, plaques and tangles, um, there are probably separate diseases, but because we started off putting this concept, this is all Alzheimer's disease, it makes it very hard to see those patterns. And if we if we become overly fixated on this is the definition of, of Alzheimer's, and there can be no other, or this is the definition of dementia, and there can be no other, we'll we'll miss the ability to to see those finer patterns, to see the new segmentations, to understand um, you know there's 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 differences. Um, early onset Alzheimer's is is different from late onset Alzheimer's, is different from uh, you know, dementia pugilistica, right? Um, you know, uh, from you know, um, uh, blunt force head trauma and and all the rest of it. You see similar similar endpoints in all those cases. And you can see the same thing in in chronic kidney disease or heart failure. A whole bunch of these endpoints are are I believe common endpoints of different um, uh, different processes. Uh, and and by putting them under these labels, right? And to some extent, OMOP and fire, more so OMOP and and you know ICD and SNOMED they kind of fix these labels as absolute truth. But again, they're like poverty, right? Mm -hmm. It's one way to describe something, but but what actually is, you know, uh, a particular ICD code, right? Again, it's not like you can wave a wand over someone and it will pop up what their ICD code is, mm -hmm. right? It's the same way that I can hold a measuring stick up to someone or I can measure their temperature uh, or I can look at the levels of specific electrolytes in their blood, right? Those, mm -hmm. that's the real data you have to work with. You have to allow the, the concepts, to your point, to be fluid, right? Uh, in response to the data you're collecting and the observations you're making. I got a, a message that came in on my cell phone on, on text here, friend. Mm -hmm. It's about labeling. And it's a take on a comment that I made actually in social media that, um, you know, somebody has to label these clusters. You know, first of all, I don't think we're seeing enough supervised and unsupervised clustering in healthcare, right? We're stuck on predictive models. That's a different issue. We're going to see more supervised and unsupervised clustering, right? That's going to be that's uh, coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody's got to label those clusters. And my, I, I'm concerned that SNOMED, ICD, and LOINC are inadequate as languages and language models for labeling those clusters. I think we need to evolve the language of healthcare to be more precise, more clinically friendly, more research relevant. Is that what do you think? Am I being too cynical there? No, no. I mean, and and, uh, and again, I I try and expand everyone's thinking on that a little bit with with an analogy, right? Um, think of the diversity of languages on um, amongst humanity, the 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 thousands of languages that are currently spoken, and the hundreds of thousands of languages that have been spoken across time. Mm -hmm. um, and some languages are similarities, right? The Romance languages are similar. Some languages stand all alone by themselves, like Finnish is not related to anything, right? Um, and that's fine. And you know, and there is this ability to translate between those languages, but each language is able to give shades of meaning and uh, different uh, different rhythms uh, and different, you know, uh, not just the denotations, but the connotations that go along with it um, that don't necessarily translate. From from one language to another, right? And that's that's part of the beauty of it is that is that you can express um, uh, uh, similar ideas in different languages, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, to different emotional uh, effects at, at, at different times, right? And you you can look at that as we'll never understand each other, we'll never be able to communicate, we'll never be able to to move forward. Or you can look at it as um, uh, find the the language that's appropriate to the to the problem at at hand, right? If we're trying to um, you know uh, negotiate um uh tr you know trade deals uh uh with um you know with europe well then it's probably going to be around the romance languages and we'll, you know make that the sort of the space you're working in right yeah uh, the analogy begins to break down a little bit at that point in time but but it's the that's more the way that i would i would think about it is each one of those is um is a con each language is a concept it's a it's a it's a conceptual framework that you're layering onto it and reality is not a concept reality mm -hmm 
is, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the challenge that I see, well, anyway, we can talk forever about this, but, you know, ICD grew, ICD grew up as a public health reporting system. You know, ICD-11 is getting better for sure. Um, SNOMED grew up as this sort of post-coordinated thing that you have to stitch together to describe what happened a priori. So it's awkward to use analytically. Um, and then Moink has a number of problems with it, but uh, mostly its adoption is so low. But anyway, I, it would be interesting to see how we evolve our languages to describe healthcare. You know, for instance, right, there was a Mount Sinai paper that came out a couple of years ago that clearly identified five different subtypes of diabetic patients from clustering that have no real ability. We don't have a, an ability to tag and label those with SNOMED and ICD. They, they just aren't represented in the language. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Yeah, uh, exactly right. I mean, and that's, that should be the way it goes, right? And either SNOMED evolves to go and, and uh, recognize those five, or you use a different, uh, a different framework, conceptual framework that recognizes them. But again, I would come back to the same thing. Okay, so you've got these five yeah. new classes, so what? Yeah do anything with it then if it doesn't impact care if it doesn't impact the cost of care if it doesn't impact the quality of care if it doesn't change your workflow um it's a great academic piece and it's basic science and maybe it leads to something down the line but but uh i think we're and i i totally believe in all that and i'm not trying to say that there shouldn't be people who do that and devote their lives to it I, it's wonderful uh, a lot of great stuff comes out of basic science and basic research um, but for for where i sit and for the work that, that we're doing we're trying to uh, actually make an impact uh, on healthcare as a whole. I have a lot of faith in Northwell Aegis and you to have an impact on the industry, friend. I really do. I have the culture of Northwell and Michael Dowling and, you know, the history of Aegis and their world. I mean, it's a good combination. I'm really excited about it. And I'm speaking as a patient as much as I am anything else there. Well, thank you. That, that um, we're excited too. Yeah. Um, now, I, we go on for a long time. I can hang out for a little while here if you can. We still have yeah. 50 people. I've got, on I've got people. I've got people pinging me, so I've probably got. All right. Go. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate you so much as a person and a friend and a professional and an intellect. You're just a great human being. Thank you. Thank you. It's a it's a it's a pleasure as always, and and the feelings go go both ways. Um, I think I get as much out of our conversations uh, 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 as as you do. So. It's a lot of fun. The problem is I always come away from our conversation feeling inadequate. So that's, uh, I've got to figure out how to deal with that. <laughs> all right. This is all right. <laughs> Jordan, uh, I don't know if you're still on or not. Friend, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go ahead and close out today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dale, for a great uh, chat and presentation. Um, we hope you found this information in today's webinar useful. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to message your client executive at sales at imlhealth.com. Thanks for attending and please stay healthy and safe out there. Have a blessed day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.